Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing today? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So I would like to introduce you to the newest member of the Marvel family. This is Ranger. Uh, Ranger is a seven-month-old Australian cattle dog who we have now had for two weeks. Uh, he is super cute, super sweet, tons of fun, and definitely all puppy. Uh, so we, had, um, we, we have another dog, Charlie, who's about 13 years old. And Charlie had a little health incident uh, about a month ago. And we've been talking for the last six months about the possibility of getting another dog because we know that Charlie won't be around forever. And this health incident was kind of like, oh, this might be the beginning of the end, so maybe we should start thinking about it. And we came across Ranger, and we were just like, oh, yes, we have to have this dog. And so now, um, for those of you who might be worried about Charlie, Charlie's actually doing fine. Like, Charlie has recovered really well. I think she's got plenty of time left in front of her. Um, but I've quickly remembered and been reminded how much work a young puppy is. When you've had a dog who's 13 years old for a while, you're like, oh man, this, this guy is tons of work. And what you do when you get a new dog in the house is you start to establish them in their new environment, right? You create boundaries for them. You say, this couch is off limits. This room is not for you. You create routines so they know what to expect. You teach them about food and which food belongs to them and which food belongs to the other dog and everybody else. And the thing you're hoping for the thing you want to have happen quickly is that the dog is house trained, that it knows where it's supposed to go to the bathroom and where it's not supposed to go to the bathroom. So last Saturday was really a wash of a day weather-wise, right? It was gross, it was windy, it was rainy, it was cool. And so we have been having a conversation with, in our house with our two, other, our two youngest daughters uh, about having their own room. They've been sharing a room for as long as they can remember. And in our house, we had an extra bedroom that was like a guest room and an office. And we said as we were moving into the fall, we will give you your guys your own room. We'll find a Saturday where it's crummy weather, and we'll just switch rooms around on that day. And so last Saturday happened to be that day. So we're in the middle of moving rooms around. And it wasn't just moving one kid out of one room and putting them in another room. It was a rearranging of our room and two other rooms. And it was just, it felt like we were moving. We're moving beds, we're moving dressers, we're moving cat. I mean, just so much stuff. And for whatever reason, throughout the course of that day, Ranger decided to pee on everything. I mean everything. Beds, comforters, piles of clothes, couches. Like we were chasing him with like carpet cleaner, like getting, and it was just like, and we would take him outside. He would go to the bathroom and we're like, at, we've got at least an hour and a half before he has to go again. He'd come back in 15 minutes later. He's going on something. And I'm like, this, what? And by the end of that day, we were really discouraged because the week, I mean, we've only had him for two weeks, right? It's so like, what do we expect? But the week leading up to last Saturday, he did really well. He had an accident here or there. But on the whole, he was establishing a good rhythm and a routine. And then Saturday was like everything came undone. And so we went to bed that night just kind of like frustrated and discouraged. And like, are we going to need to get new sheets and new carpets and this and that? But then I started thinking about it like, let me put myself in his little puppy mind for the last month of his life. He came from Texas, right? He was put into a foster home for two weeks, and then he was put into our house for one week. And after one week in our house, we start like moving all the furniture, upending this new environment that he's in. So naturally, he's like, what's going on? Am I moving again? I just was getting comfortable. And now everything is getting upended. And I was thinking like, yeah, even for us as humans, when our life gets upended, right, we respond in the same way. I mean, not the exact same way, right? <laughs> But, but we respond with concern and worry and fear. And I think that's what was going on in his little puppy mind. Like, my world is being all disorganized again. Because when we find ourselves in seasons where life feels like it's upended, it's like, oh, how in the world am I supposed to navigate this? So I, I will never forget the week of March 12th, 2020. As I'm sure all of us, 
have memories of that week. It was Thursday, March 12th. I was walking into La Miranda in Walker's Point, going to have a birthday dinner with some friends of ours. And as we're walking into this restaurant, my phone starts to blow up. I mean, people are messaging me, did you see this church and what their message was? Did you see this church and this video that they put out? Did you see this church and their announcement? Like churches that day all over the place were starting to cancel in-person services because of COVID with no thought of like, oh, this is when we'll start to resume them just indefinitely. And I remember sitting at that dinner totally disconnected from what was happening at the table, thinking like, what decision do I need to make? What decision are we going to make? And how, I mean, just two days prior, I was like, COVID's not a thing. It's, we're going to be fine, you know? And then sure enough, by the end of that weekend, we had canceled services. And the week, pro- the week following, I mean, I was reading anything I could read, listening to whoever I could listen to, calling doctors, what am I supposed to do? Feeling like my life was just turned upside down as all of us did, feeling like, what in the world am I supposed to do next? And when we find ourselves in those places where life is upended, the question for us is, what is it that we need? And maybe you're here this morning, and you're like, yeah, my life feels like that today. My life feels like it's been turned upside down. I don't know how to make sense of what's right in front of me, or what am I supposed to do tomorrow? And I need some help to figure it out. Now, maybe you're here this morning, and you don't feel like that. Maybe you're like, yeah, my life is fine. It's like firm, and it's secure, and it's established, and it's okay. But there will come a season when your life is upended. And the question is, how is it that we respond? And specifically, what is it that we need in order to bring certainty in an uncertain season. And as Paul finishes his letter to the church in Rome, he actually offers us an answer to that question and has a similar concern for the church in Rome that their life too could be upended. Maybe not socially, but certainly spiritually. This is what he says in verse 17. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions. Now, Paul has covered so much ground in the book of Romans. I mean, he's talked about the righteousness and the wrath of God. He's talked about how the story of Israel finds its fulfillment in the story of Jesus. He's talked about the glory of God and the suffering and the persecution that he could face and Christians across the world could face. He's talked about all of these things and how Gentiles find their way into the family of God's people. But in the midst of all of this that he's been talking about, these now are his final words. And final words are wildly significant, especially when you're talking about a piece of communication, the length of Romans, because he's saying, this is the thing I want to leave you with. And he says, watch out for those who cause divisions. Paul's final words here accentuate the main point and the reason why he's writing Romans to begin with. Because his main concern for the church in Rome is that their lives could be divided, their spiritual lives could be split over disputable matters. Read back to chapter 14 and 15. He's saying, don't destroy the work of God for disputable matters. Like, don't let it tear you apart. He's worried that the church will be divided and split over these things. So he's calling the church to unity in the book of Romans, but he's also here saying, be alert. Be alert, because there will be those who come into the church and intentionally cause division. And he says, the way that they will do it is this. He says, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Essentially saying there will be those who come in and teach you false things intentionally to cause division amongst you. Watch out, be on alert for them, and keep away from them. I mean, think about it this way. Like, who here has a copy of the book of Romans? 
Let me help you out. You all should be raising your hands. If you have a Bible, you have a copy of the letter to the church in Rome, right? If you don't have a Bible, take one of the pew Bibles in front of you. That's our gift to you. I have 10 Bibles in my office. I probably have another five at home. I even have one in Greek. And then we have all of these digital versions that we can access at any point. We have hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of versions and copies of the book of Romans at our disposal like that. When Paul wrote the letter to the church in Rome and he handed it to Phoebe to take it there from Corinth, do you know how many copies there were at that time? There was one. It wasn't as though he's like, take this to the copy machine, Xerox a few more before we send it out. There was one copy. Now, what's interesting about the New Testament is that multiple writers, Paul himself is always saying, beware of false teachers. And it's like, well, what's the concern about false teachers all the time in the New Testament? Well, the concern is people in the first century Greco-Roman world who are in the church can't sit down, open their Bible, and study the Scriptures because the Scriptures had not yet been put together. They had not been codified in a book and assembled. and bound. I mean, there wasn't even a printing press at that point, right? So it was just like handwritten letters that were getting circulated around. So for the church in Rome, a church of probably about 100 people, there was one copy of this one letter. That probably was going to leave soon because it probably was going to go to another church in a neighboring community and be read there. So in the ancient world, it would not have been uncommon for teachers and philosophers and orators to come and travel through Rome, teach whatever they're teaching, and then move on. I mean, it was kind of a form of entertainment for those in the world at this time. The, the way that we go to movies, they would go listen to a speaker or an orator for entertainment. So it wouldn't be unusual for them to hear somebody that sounded persuasive, that sounded compelling, maybe even said things that sounded similar to Paul, but they didn't have the ability to test it against Paul's teaching in the same way that we did because they didn't have the scriptures like we do. But Paul is saying, these teachers, beware of these teachers, for he says in first, verse 18, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery. They deceive the minds of naive people. He's saying, be alert to contrary teaching that could be deceptive. Which means he's saying there is potential for the spiritual lives of this church in Rome to be upended based on teaching that's not true. Because all of a sudden it could be some random teacher comes into town, there's some people who listen, oh, you got to hear this guy, and they start ta chasing after all of this false teaching. Like, I heard this guy just the other day. He was saying, Jesus is the Son of God, but guess what? There's this other figure who's the daughter of God, and we need to elevate both and worship him both because we're a part of this family of God. I'm making that up, by the way. That's not really an ancient teaching. I'm just, you know, that could be something that would be like, oh, that there's language there that sounds similar to what Paul would have said, and all of a sudden the church church is chasing after all of this additional teaching that is not grounded in what Paul has taught them. And Paul's concern is that it could easily cause further division in the church. And this is true in our day too. It happens even in our day. I can remember when we lived in Atlanta, there was a rapidly growing Muslim population in Atlanta. In our neighborhood alone, there was a mosque right around the corner from our church. We had Muslim neighbors that we got to know. They were wonderful people, super sweet. Um, but there was a church in the area that had this desire to reach Muslims and share the gospel with them. And they created this course to train their church and anybody else who was interested. And they called it Jesus in the Quran. Because Jesus is a figure that's in the Quran. Jesus is a figure that is esteemed by Muslims. They just view Jesus in a very different way than we do. 
So we had some people from our church go and attend this class, and they were like super excited about it. And they came back and were in a conversation with me. They're like, Brian, we took this class. It was amazing. It was like a a 16-week course. And after the first week or two, they're like, this is what we've learned, that the God of Islam is the same as the God of Christianity. And I was like, wait a minute. Mm." And so what they learned was that Islam and Christianity actually have similar origins in the person of Abraham. So if you know the story of Abraham, Abraham is called by God to be a blessing to the entire world. He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you so you can bless the entire world. I'm going to give you descendants. Your descendants will be more numerous than the stars in the sky. One problem, Abraham doesn't have a son or a daughter, has no kids. So he and his wife, Sarah, are like, okay, God's going to give us kids. Years go by, no kids. Sarah has a maidservant named Hagar, and she gives Hagar to Abraham to say, well, if I can't have a kid, maybe Hagar can give us a kid. And they have a son named Ishmael. God comes back and he's like, hold up. Like, that's not how this is going to work. You don't get to force my hand and me fulfilling my promise the way you think it should happen and in the time frame with which you think it should happen. He says, I will come back and you will have a son through Sarah. So Sarah eventually does have a son named Isaac. And the interesting difference between Ishmael and Isaac is that Ishmael is a historic figure that leads us to the religion of Islam. Ishmael becomes a prophet in Islam. He becomes an esteemed figure in the Muslim religion where Isaac leads us to Jesus and to the Christian faith. And the reason we would say that the God of Islam is not the same as the God of Christianity is because we would say Jesus is the embodiment of God. Jesus is the full revelation of God, and he is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God who has come in the flesh to take away the sins of the world, where Islam would see him only as a prophet that adds value, but doesn't bring redemption and salvation. And so even in our day, we had to unwind this with them. You know, I'm sure the intention of the class was not to teach this, but in their young faith, that's what they picked up and that's what they heard. And so we had to go and kind of retool all that for them and show them how we think it's different and where the distinction is. But Paul is saying, that you have to be aware of contrary teaching. That might sound good. It might sound persuasive. It might even sound like it fits in line with what we're saying, but it is going to be different in its end point. And he says, when you hold to the teaching that I have given to you, the thing that you develop is wisdom and the ability to distinguish between good and evil. He says this in verse 19. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Saying when you hold to the teaching that he has given, it cultivates wisdom and discernment and helps you distinguish between good and evil. So Paul is encouraging them. He's urging them to be alert to what's going on around them. The other thing he's urging them and encouraging them to do is to be connected. Because a big part of this last chapter is all of the names that Paul lists out, right? If you read the beginning of chapter 16, there are almost 30 names that Paul gives. Now, these would be people who are in Rome. He's writing to the church in Rome, and he's saying, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, tell this person I said hello, I can't wait to see you. This person was really important to me, so make sure you listen to what they have to say. So he's writing to all of these people, listing some of them. And then here he inserts another shorter list of names, These would be the people who are with him in Corinth as he is writing the letter. This is what we read in verse 21. He says, Timothy, my co-worker, sends his greetings to you, as does Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my fellow Jews. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. It's a little interesting tidbit, right? Paul actually didn't write this letter down. He would have been in the room with Tertius dictating it, but he didn't write it with his own hand. Verse 23, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, 
sends you his greeting. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. So Paul is giving another shorter list of names, which all highlights that ministry for Paul, the work that Paul is doing, is a team sport. Like Paul needs people to accomplish the things that God has put in front of him to do. Even something as simple as writing a letter. See, we're not told how these other people, I mean, apart from Tertius, we're not told how these other people engaged specifically in the process of writing this letter, but we know that Paul wasn't alone. So, sometimes I wonder if we have this perception that Paul gets this inspiration from the Spirit. He goes to his little writing room, he shuts the door, he lights a candle, and he just, in one shot, writes it down and emerges from this room saying, ah, the word of the Lord, I've completed it, right? When in reality, letter writing in the ancient world was a very different process than the way that we just like shoot off emails to people today. I mean, one, materials for writing a letter were expensive, and two, the common letter in the ancient world was wildly short. So in the Greco-Roman world, a common private letter would have been about 90 words long. That's a short paragraph of two or three sentences. The average length of a public letter would have been about 200 words long. Paul's average letter length from the letters in the New Testament, 1,300 words. The length of Romans is over 7,000 words. I mean, this is mind-blowing what he's doing, writing this big tome, like a letter that's 7,000 words long. So it would have been expensive to acquire all the materials needed to write this letter. You don't just go to Staples or Office Max and buy a ring of paper. I mean, paper is expensive and the ink and everything. He probably needed, would have needed help with the funding to buy those materials. Correcting mistakes when you're writing a letter in the ancient world isn't easy and it's like, oh, I can't believe we made a mistake. And the time it took would have been more than just a day. I mean, it takes me a handful of days to put a sermon together. The length of my sermons, if you were to actually do a word count, probably between 3,000 and 4,000 words, right? I don't actually write a manuscript, but when it's all said and done, 3,000, 4,000 words. So it takes me days to think through, how, how am I going to start? What am I going to put here? I'm like moving things around all the time. Paul doesn't have the luxury to, to write some things out, highlight it, copy, paste. I'm going to put it in a document over here and then rework it. I mean, he's doing something that is highly unusual and, and really time consuming. So he needs help with funding. He needs help with a scribe to actually write it. He needs a place, right? There's a guy named Gaius who hosts him to have a place to write it. And then I would imagine he's probably having conversations with Timothy, like, hey, I'm going to say this, I'm going to pull this Old Testament verse or quote, what do you think about this? So it could even been that other people spoke into the letter as well. And what I think Paul is demonstrating here is that we all need people. We all need people in our lives, whether we're doing ministry work or something that God has put in front of us to do, or just some days getting through a day. We need people. We were created to be in relationship with people. We were created to do life with people. It's hardwired in us. The one thing that God says is not good in his creation, if you go back to Genesis 1 and 2 when he's creating everything, it's not good for man to be alone. Like, we need people. And what was so challenging about the pandemic a couple years ago, when our lives were upended, is we were told, hey, we're gonna, your lives are going to be upended, but don't go spend time with people. Like, stay away from people. Almost three years later, we are still feeling the social, emotional, and the mental effects of the isolation that was caused in that season because we were created to be with people. We need to be connected. And Paul's saying for you spiritually, to make it through life spiritually, you need to be on alert, but you also need to be connected. And the last thing he's encouraging them is to also be established. This is what he says in verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, 
the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God. So this truly is Paul's parting words. His benediction, if you will. His final encouragement is to be established. To be established. Now, the Greek word here is sterizo, which has an image of it of being planted, of being firm and secure in something that has support so that when hard winds come, when tumultuous seasons come, you won't get knocked over. Right? Again, go back to last Saturday. Last Saturday, 50 mile an hour winds, a mess of a day weather-wise, rain, cold. Once the weather calmed down, I think it was Sunday afternoon, I was walking our dog through the neighborhood, and there were branches just all over the place, like branches down, small branches, big branches, everywhere. I actually like to pick up branches when they're blown off because I save them for my fire pit. And it's like, oh, I got kindling now. This is convenient. But there wasn't, there wasn't, what I noticed was there were branches, but there weren't any trees that were knocked over, right? Why? Because trees have root systems that go deep into the ground that secure them and establish them and give them a firm foundation so that when strong wind does come, it doesn't blow them over. And Paul is saying the call is to be established, to be firm, secure, specifically, he says, in the gospel. He says, be on alert, beware, keep watch for contrary teaching that will come your way. The teaching that Paul has given, first and foremost, is the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That's where he starts his letter in the first few verses of chapter 1. I'm eager to proclaim that Jesus is Lord over all, that he is the one, the true King of kings, the true Lord of lords, who's holding all things together. He will establish you firm and secure in me. And it's interesting here that at the end of the letter, Paul is actually doing a call back to the very beginning of the letter, not just in naming the gospel, but also using this word to establish, the word sterizo. Because if you go to chapter 1, verse 11, Paul will say, I long to see you, right? He starts his letter saying, oh, I can't wait to get to Rome to see you. He says, I want to impart some spiritual gift to you. I want to encourage you so that it will make you strong. The Greek word for strong, chapter 1, verse 11, it's the same word here, sterizo. He says, I want you to be strong. It's where he starts his letter and where he finishes his letter. I want you to be established specifically in the gospel. Why? Because he goes on to say the gospel is the power of God. He says in chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. And notice where that power comes from. If we go here to verse 25, now to him who is able, the Greek word for able is the same Greek word for power. It's the Greek word dunamai. He who is powerful will establish you. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the dunamai of God. The gospel gives you power. The gospel gives you strength. The gospel is the message into which we are established so that when life feels like it's upended, we have security in a firm foundation. And so the question is how? How is it that the gospel becomes an establishment for us that gives us power, especially when life is upended? I think two ways. One, the gospel reminds you of who you are. Do you know who you are? Maybe you're here in a season of you're like, I have no idea. I've been trying to figure out that out for years. I'm in a season where life has changed for me, and it feels like I'm having to figure out who I am all over again. Do you know who you are? Let me tell you who you are. You are loved. You are loved way more than you could ever imagine. 
Paul's prayer for the church. If you go to Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul's prayer for that church in Ephesians 3. It's like, I pray that you would be rooted and established in love. And he says in Romans 8, do you, do you know what has the potential to separate you from God's love? Nothing. He says, nothing will separate you from the love of God because it is strong, it's firm and secure. And you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but. No, there are no yeah buts with God's love. You're like, but you don't know how this morning went for me. No, you're right, I don't. But it doesn't matter. You don't know what happened yesterday, two years ago, or the life that I used to live. You're right, I don't. But you are loved. And when you rest in that, when you believe that, when you remind yourself of that, it can change everything. A couple years ago, one of my daughters was going through a period of separation anxiety. So if she would go to school, she would get nervous. If she would go to a friend's house, she would get nervous. And one day she's getting ready to leave the house to go spend some time with a friend. And we were processing that. And she went upstairs to her room and got dressed. And she came back down and she had this piece of paper in her hand. She said, Dad, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take this paper and write me a note. And I'm going to put it in my pocket. And when I get nervous or anxious because I'm not with you, I'm going to take out that note. I'm going to read it. And it's going to remind me of something that you want to tell me. And I was like, that's amazing. Like she would have been like eight years old at this point. I was like, you bet I'll write you a note. And I said, dear sweetie, I love you, dad. She folded it up, put it in her pocket, and away she went. The gospel is God's message to us that you are loved more than you could ever know. That God broke the bank. He bet the farm. He cashed in all his chips in sending Jesus to be the sacrificial, atoning human for the redemption of the entire world. You are loved. The, the, the second thing, that the gospel does for us in making us strong is it gives us hope. It gives us hope that one day, yes, this world is broken. This world is tumultuous and insecure and scary and difficult, and one day it will all be made right. That's why Paul says in chapter 8, we are more than conquerors. In Jesus, we are victorious. We are people who live knowing the end of the story. And we have hope in that that one day Jesus will return and he will take everything that is broken and he will make it right. See, what Paul is saying, what he's trying to communicate to the church in Rome is this, that being established in gospel-centered community guards and guides your life. Being established in gospel-centered community In a community of people who hold fast to the gospel because they know it gives them strength. They know it gives them wisdom. They know it gives them hope. And as they do it together, as they link arms in community together, it's like, I can face anything. Anything. That doesn't mean life will always be easy and ideal. But it means even in the difficulty, even when life feels upended, I have hope. And Paul is concerned that the church in Rome could experience their spiritual lives being upended. He's saying, be on alert. Hold fast to the gospel. Be connected. Be established in it. And here's why. It's not just for ourselves. His final words are this. So that, it's his purpose statement, so that... The Gentiles, essentially those who are not in the family of God, might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Essentially, when we as a community are grounded in the gospel, when the world sees a church that knows what they believe and why and is committed to each other, and when they see a church that has this supernatural power moving through it, especially in difficult times, especially when life is upended, 
they look at that community and they're like, maybe. Maybe they have something that I need. Uh, it was probably my first year as a pastor at this church. And there was one Sunday morning, this young woman walked in. She walked in with a friend. And I noticed that she was new, that it was her first time. So after service, I just kind of walked up to her and I said, Hey, I'm Brian. Nice to meet you. Who are you? She introduced herself. And then the very first words out of her mouth was, My fiancé is about to become a police officer. I am scared out of my mind. And that's why I'm here. I have no idea what her faith background was. I have no idea if she was even a Christian at that point. But she was like, I'm scared and I'm terrified and I need somebody to walk with me through what's coming my way because I have no idea what it is. So we connected her and her fiance to a marriage mentor couple to do some premarital counseling for them. It's what we do with all people who are wanting to get married here. We got her and him connected to a neighborhood community so that they could be in connection with people. And I was friends with the individual who was leaving their neighborhood, leaving their neighborhood community, and we would get together re regularly, and he would be like, man, Jesus is all over her. Like, he is doing something in her life. He is turning her life over, and it's amazing to watch and amazing to hear the things that she says. God is at work in her life in powerful ways. They have since uh, mo they moved further out from the city and have, have moved away. Um, but I know, without a shadow of a doubt, that this community made a huge impact on her because of the presence of God here and the way that she was embraced and welcomed in and encouraged. And we have the opportunity to do that regularly for people. I read this quote uh, not that long ago that says, one of the major problems of the world today isn't so much that the world has this overwhelming sense of guilt, meaning those who are non-believers, but that there is this overwhelming sense of hopelessness in the world today. And when people walk into our doors with zero hope, we have the ability to show them that through Jesus Christ and the gospel, there's a firm foundation on which we plant our feet that gives us security because we know that Jesus has raised from the dead, that he's holding all things together, and there will come a day when he makes all things new. So may you see and may you be alert to the messages of our world and how at times they are contrary to the gospel. And may you be deeply connected in spiritual community with others so that together you can hold fast to the hope we have in Jesus. And may you be so established in the message of Christ that the world sees what you have and wants it. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the scriptures, that they are your revelation to us, that we are people who have access to you and to the power that you have for us through your written word. Lord, it is so easy to take it for granted. And so, Lord, we just say thank you again for Romans, for Paul's writing, for us to have access to who you are. And may we hold fast, Lord, to the message of the gospel. May it overwhelm us with its beauty and its magnitude and its power that we would be people who embrace it wholeheartedly and are able to extend it to the world around us. We pray this in your name. Amen.